Earlier this afternoon, anyway, sent out a release that they expected that to come up at about 3.15 Eastern. Purpose of the gentleman from California seek recognition. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend the remarks and insert extraneous material on H.R. 4130. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that my amendment number one be modified in the manner I have placed at the desk. Pursuant to House Resolution 661 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House, the Committee of the Whole House, and the State of the Union for further consideration of H.R. 4310. Will the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Yoder, please take the chair? The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the further consideration of the bill H.R. 4310, which the clerk will report by title. A bill to authorize appropriations for fiscal year 2013 for military activities of the Department of Defense. To, to prescribe military personnel strengths for fiscal year 2013 and for other purposes. When the Committee of the Whole House rose on Wednesday, May 16, 2012, a time for general debate pursuant to House Resolution 656 had expired. Pursuant to House Resolution 661, no further general debate shall be in order. In lieu of the amendment in the nature of a substitute recommended by the Committee on Armed Services printed in the bill, it shall be in order to consider as an original bill for the purpose of amendment under the five-minute rule an amendment in the nature of a substitute consisting of the text of the Rules Committee printed 112-22. That amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be considered as read. No amendment to that amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be in order except those printed in House Report 112-485 and amendments in block described in Section 3 of House Resolution 661. Each amendment printed in the report shall be considered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment, and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. It shall be in order at any time for the chair of the Committee on Armed Services or his designee to offer amendments in block, consisting of amendments printed in the report not earlier disposed of. Such amendments in block shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for 20 minutes equally divided, and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Armed Services or their designees, shall not be subject to amendment, and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. The original proponent of an amendment included in such amendments in block may insert a statement in the congressional record immediately before the disposition of the amendments in block. It is now in order to consider amendment number one, printed in House Report 112-485. For what purposes, the gentleman from California seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number one, printed in House Report number 112-485, offered by Mr. McKeon of California. Pursuant to House Resolution 661, the gentleman from California, Mr. McKeon, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California for five minutes. Mr. Chair, I ask unanimous consent that my amendment number one be modified in the manner that I've placed at the desk. Clerk will report the modification. Modification to amendment number one printed in House Report number 112-485, offered by Mr. McKeon of California. At the end of the amendment, add the following. At the end of subtitle A of Title VII, add the following. Section 704, certain treatment of autism under TRICARE, A, in general. Section 1077 of Title X, United States Code, is amended by adding at the end of the following new subsection, G1. Clerk will suspend. Committee will be in order. Clerk may continue. In providing health care under subsection A to a covered beneficiary described in paragraph 3A, the treatment of autism spectrum disorders shall include behavioral health treatment, including a applied behavior analysis when prescribed by a physician. Two. Mr. Chair, I ask unanimous consent that the modifi modification be considered as read. Is there an objection to dispensing with the reading? Without objection, the reading is dispensed. Is there objection to modifying the amendment? 
That objection, the amendment is modified. The gentleman from California may continue. Mr. Chair, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman's recognized. We have uh, worked long and hard, the staff's worked long and hard to get us to this point. This manager's amendment that we've worked on has been worked through both sides. We have uh, unanimous agreement on it. It's a, it's a good bill, a good addition to the bill, and I ask that it be uh, approved. Serves. The gentleman from Washington seeks recognition. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Although I am not opposed, I ask unanimous consent to claim uh, the time in opposition. Without objection, gentlemen's recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Actually, I yield uh, at this time two and a half minutes to the gentleman from California, Mr. Berman, ranking member on the uh, Foreign the Affairs Committee. The gentleman from California is recognized for two and a half minutes. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, uh, um, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Smith, for yielding me this time, and I rise in support of the manager's amendment, but to speak in support of the Smith Amendment, which is part of the N Block Amendment, which will be taken up next. And I'm pleased to join Ranking Member Smith, Chairman McKean, Foreign Affairs Chair Ross Leighton as sponsor of uh, the Smith Amendment. I'm particularly pleased that this amendment incorporates most of H.R. 3288, the Safeguarding United States Satellite Leadership and Security Act legislation I introduced last November, along with Dan Manzullo, Adam Smith, Dutch Ruppersberger, Rob Bishop, Martin Heinrich, Mike Kaufman, and Jerry Conley. We have since been joined by 12 other co-sponsors from both sides of the aisle, many of whom are also co-sponsors of this amendment. Mr. Chairman, this bipartisan amendment, which will be part of the in bloc, would help restore America's global competitiveness in high-tech satellite technology and protect vital U.S. national security interests. Treating commercial satellites and components as if they were lethal weapons, regardless of whether, whether they're going to friend or foe, has gravely harmed American space manufacturers. A view of borne out by numerous studies, industry assessments, and the administration's own recent 1248 report to Congress. We depend on these manufacturers for our own critical defense needs. If onerous restrictions prevent them from competing in the international marketplace, then they can't innovate and ultimately cannot survive. This amendment also supports UN na U.S. national security. It includes a strict prohibition on any satellite exports to China, the original concern that caused Congress to transfer all satellites to the munitions list, as well as to Iran, North Korea, Syria, Sudan, and Cuba. I urge my colleagues to support the amendment. I thank uh, the chair and the ranking member of the committee for uh, their support of this uh, amendment and yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman you. from California yields back. The gentleman from Washington reserves. The gentleman from California, Mr. McKeon, is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I just want to rise to commend the gentleman, Mr. Verman, for his strong work on this amendment, for the work that he's done to uh, further this cause of helping businesses in, in uh, being able to do business abroad while still protecting the security of America. And um, if there, do you have any further speakers? I'm going to close on, on my side. Reserve. The gentleman from California reserves. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, yield myself the balance of my time. Gentleman's I support the manager's amendment, amendment. I'm going to speak the balance of my time on the Smith Amash amendment coming up later. Uh, there's been a great deal of distorted information going out. I want to take this opportunity to correct some of it. First of all, the Gohmert amendment that's being offered does not solve the problem you will still be subject to military custody and indefinite detention. It is not clear on that point. Leaves open the possibility the president will maintain that authority, and that is what this debate should be all about. The president right now has the authority to go outside of the normal due process, constitutionally protected rights um, that are part of a court trial, and lock somebody up indefinitely or place them in military custody here in the U.S., that is an extraordinary amount of power to give the executive branch over individual freedom and liberty. I don't think it is necessary to keep us safe, 
10 years of successfully prosecuting, convicting, and locking up terrorists under Article III courts has proven that point. But hands down, the dumbest set of arguments I've ever heard in debating has been circulating that somehow taking away this extraordinary power from the president rewards terrorists. I would like to remind everybody, and particularly Tea Party conservatives, that just because the government arrests you doesn't mean you're guilty. Under their thinking, basically once the government says you're a terrorist, you're a terrorist, and we shouldn't have a trial about it. So any effort to make sure that there's a process, to make sure that you actually are a terrorist, becomes rewarding them. No, it's the process to make sure they are actually guilty. I cannot believe the Tea Party conservatives want to create a situation where when the government says you're guilty of a crime, that's it. No trial, no process, let's just lock you up and forget about it. That's why we have a court system. Let's have the real debate here. Does the president need this authority to keep us safe? I don't believe he does. Let's stop these ridiculous arguments about rewarding terrorists and have some respect for the Constitution and due process. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Washington yields back the remainder of his time. The gentleman from California, Mr. McKeon, is recognized. As was the gentleman, that was your closing remark. Uh, at this point, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield the remainder balance of our time to the the uh, Vice Chairman of the Committee, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Thornberry. The gentleman from Texas is, is recognized for the remainder of the time. I, I thank the Chairman for yielding. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, we're going to have ample opportunity to debate uh, a number of the issues that the distinguished ranking member raised. But I don't think that we can be here on the floor and allow some of the arguments that have been made to go without some challenge. For example, to say that a letter signed by two former attorney generals, a former secretary of Homeland Security, and a variety of other officials who have had positions of responsibility in previous administrations who believe that the Smith-Amash Amendment would be detrimental to our effort against terrorists, to say that those arguments are somehow silly or foolish, I think really uh, demeans past administrations, it is, it is not actually fitting for this sort of debate. I understand that emotions can run high when we talk about these issues. And there are serious issues to be discussed, some difficult problems and some clear differences. But I, I hope that in the future the, the nature of the debate is elevated somewhat between, beyond calling former distinguished officials names. No, I will not yield. And, and, and let me make one other point. One of the key problems that many of us have with the Smith-Amash Amendment is that it would bestow upon illegal aliens who come to this country to carry out terrorist attacks. It would bestow upon them full constitutional rights. That means basically that if I said I would not yield. I, would I asked again. The, the gentleman from Texas controls the time. What that means is, as soon as a, a member of Al-Qaeda sets foot on American soil, the first thing he hears after you are under arrest is you have the right to remain silent. You have the right to be provided an attorney, and if you can't afford one, an attorney will be provided with you. Now, th there may be differences about how we should treat illegal aliens who come here as members of al-Qaeda to conduct terrorist attacks, but I think the vast majority of people in this body and around the country do not think give it, telling them they have the right to remain silent as the first thing they hear is, is a wise thing. So as, as you go through the arguments, and I would encourage members of, of the House to read the letter themselves. I would encourage members of the House to look at today's Wall Street Journal editorial. I would encourage members of the House to look at the Heritage Foundation uh, entry today on, on, on their website, to look at the, how significant these issues are, how they would undermine, how the Smith-Amash Amendment would undermine our ability to defend our people, and how it is unfair to characterize concerns expressed by a dozen or eight to ten former national security officials as, as somehow foolish or silly. I think, Mr. Chairman, that we, we can do better with that. With that, I yield back the balance of the time.
The gentleman yields back the balance of the time. The question is on the amendment as modified, offered by the gentleman from California. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment as modified is agreed to. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, pursuant to H. Res. 661, I offer amendments in block. The clerk will designate the amendments in block. On block number one, consisting of amendments numbered 2, 13, 14, 15, 16, 21, 23, 25, 27, 28, 40, 43, 57, 74, <coughs> 83, 95, 97, 102, 107, and 126, printed in House Report Number 112-485, offered by Mr. McKeon of California. Pursuant to House Resolution 661, the gentleman from California, Mr. McKeon, and the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Smith, each will control 10 minutes. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I urge the committee to adopt the amendments in block, all of which have been examined by both the majority and the minority. Mr. Chair, I yield uh, at this time one minute to the gentleman from California, Mr. Gallagher. The gentleman from California is recognized for one minute. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, Chairman McKeon and also Ranking Member Smith for all their work in, in uh, putting this bill together. My amendment, which is included in the in, in block, will address the rep repercussions of the expansion of sea otters into the Southern California coastal waters with the official termination of the sea otter containment zone by the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, sea otters will begin to migrate south. As they do this, they will be invading U.S. naval testing areas. While I fully uh, support the recovery efforts of the sea otter, this does not have to happen at the expense of our national security. By creating military readiness areas around San Nicolas Island, San Clemente Island, and the shores off uh, Camp Pendleton, sea otters will be able to expand their range. At the same time, the Navy will be able to maintain their incidental taking exemption, which allows the Navy to continue their operations off the Southern California coast without harming our national security. Further, while implementing a plan for the recovery of sea otters, the Fish and Wildlife Service will have to coordinate with the Navy and the Department of Commerce on recovery efforts for other endangered and threatened species and the state of California in con continuing a viable commercial harvest the gentleman's uh, time of fisheries. Expired. Uh, I urge the, the support gentleman by an additional 30 seconds. The gentleman's recognized for additional 30 seconds. Thank you, Chairman. I urge the support of this on block amendment and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield myself uh, one minute. The gentleman's recognized for one minute. Thank you. Just to respond to the arguments from the gentleman from Texas, if an al-Qaeda terrorist comes to the U.S., whether they're an illegal alien or not, frankly, we want them arrested, tried, and convicted. All we want to do is make sure that they actually are a terrorist, is a terrorist, before we do that, to have a process in place so that the president doesn't have that power to simply lock somebody up without due process in a trial, and then the argument about how we are bestowing upon illegal aliens constitutional rights. I, I've got bad news for the gentleman from Texas. We aren't bestowing anything. The United States Constitution bestows upon them those rights. The United States Constitution says any person in the U.S., not citizen, not legal, it doesn't matter. So if he has a beef, he has a beef with James Madison and everybody else who supported the Constitution. And we hear constantly from that side, strict interpretation. The Constitution must be adhered to. The Constitution says any person, not any lawful resident or any citizen. The United States Constitution clearly figures out we're not creating anything. In fact, the Gomert Amendment goes outside the Constitution by creating rights that aren't contemplated in here, separating people in this country in terms of who should get what rights. It's in the Constitution, any person. I yield. I um, reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Washington reserves. The gentleman from California is recognized. One minute. Mr. Chair, I yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Thornberry, one minute. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate, uh, again, the, the, the strong views of the, of the distinguished ranking member. I would just say there is a real difference of opinion about to what extent consti U.S. constitutional rights, which each of us as citizens are privileged to have, are bestowed upon any illegal alien as soon as they set foot in this country. 
Now, I, there are places in the Constitution it says persons. There are other places it talks about accused. And, and, but I would point back to some of the very case law from the Supreme Court, such as the Hamde decision, which references the differences in procedure that, is to, that due process requires for a citizen versus a non-citizen. It is not a clear-cut thing to say that as soon as you set foot on this soil, then you have the right to remain silent. And the, the part that the gentleman, I, I, the, the other concern that many of us have is when you say you've got the right to remain silent, that prevents us from getting the intelligence, the information that prevents the attack of your buddy, the guy next to you. That's got to be factored in here, too. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. I would just point out the Mirandized or not, nobody has to speak, and a ton of information has come out of people after they were Mirandized. And with that, I'll yield one minute to uh, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Lewis. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for one minute. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank the ranking member for yielding. I rise in strong support of the N Block Amendment which includes my amendment that requires the Secretary of Defense, the IRS, and Commerce to calculate the total cost of the war in Afghanistan and Iraq to each American taxpayer. My amendment is about truth and transparency. Americans need to know how their taxes have been spent so we can make informed decisions about our budget. Even if you do not oppose war, don't you want to know what it costs you, your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren? For too long, there have been a big, fat, blank check for war. We need to be honest with ourselves. We need to be honest with each other. Mr. Chairman, I hope all of my colleagues will support the Lewis Amendment and this in block package. And with that, I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Chairman, at this time I yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from California for the purpose of a colloquy. The gentlelady from California is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Chairman, I thank the gentleman for this colloquy, and I would like to first thank him, uh, my good friend from California, for his leadership and his hard work in crafting this bill in support of our men and women in the military. As you know, these men and women sacrificed their lives to guarantee our safety. In return, it is our responsibility to provide the best possible care for them. Specifically, I'm returning to an issue of growing importance to our country, and that is protecting our military men and women from the detrimental effects of prescription drug misuse. Because of the physical and emotional hardships we place on our troops, they are at an increased risk for using prescription drugs and therefore misusing prescription drugs. I was encouraged to see the recommendations made by the Pain Management Task Force at DOD to mitigate the risk of prescription drug abuse and dependence in pain patients, and I'd like to work with you, Mr. Chairman, and the committee to ensure that the Department of Defense and Veterans Administration adopt these recommendations as quickly as possible. Mr. Chairman, I thank you again for your help and look forward to working with you as the National Defense Authorization Act moves into conference. And I yield to the gentleman. I do agree that protecting our men and women in the military from the detrimental effects of prescription drug misuse, especially our combat wounded service members, is of vital importance. As the gentlelady knows, the committee report of H.R. 4310 includes an item of special interest that expresses support for substance abuse treatment programs within the military services and encourage the Department of Defense to pursue research aimed at developing new treatments to help our troops who are struggling with a devastating problem. I'll be happy to work with the gentlewoman from California to consider the appropriate measures to address this critical issue. Reserve time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield one minute to the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. The gentleman I from Oregon is recognized for one minute. I appreciate the gentleman. As co-founder of the Bipartisan Working Group on Export Controls, I want to thank my colleagues for their hard work to address the system, which was created in the midst of the Cold War, but remained relatively unchanged despite the amazing advance of technology, which rendered much of it obsolete. We have an opportunity for reform in supporting the administrator's initiatives to deliver greater clarity and efficiency. I think your amendment makes progress. I have three concerns. Uh, provisions, first of all, that deal with the requirement the administration may be called upon to specify individually hundreds of thousands of parts that will be transferred, a requirement that may be impossible to comply with. 
the amendment includes seven new reporting requirements of little use, but taking valuable time away from enforcement. And finally, the, the amendment would remove the president's existing authority in place since 1998 to waive restriction on satellite exports, limiting his ability to conduct foreign policy. I commend the good work that is in the bill and hope that these provisions can be addressed as the legislation moves forward. I thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California is recognized. Reserve. Gentleman from California, reserve. Gentleman from Washington is recognized. I uh, at this time yield one minute to the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Visklosky. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized for one minute. I appreciate the gentleman yielding, and I rise to express my concern uh, that an amendment offered by Mr. Turner that is contained in the en bloc amendment does not cure provisions in the underlying bill that weaken enforcement of worker health and safety and creates a self-regulation regime for contractors at the National Nuclear Security Administration that I believe will place profit above safety. Section 3115 would move enforcement of worker health and safety from DOE's Office of Health, Safety and Security to the National Security Administration. And additionally, uh, the legislation restricts the oversight authority of the Defense Nuclear Facilities Safety Board a board that has played a vital role in independently addressing worker safety and whistleblower issues at large DOE projects. Uh, to support my position, I would quote from this year's uh, House Committee on Appropriations report accompanying the fiscal year 2013 energy and water bill. I am quoting uh, the report. The committee believes that having an independent assessment capability at the department is important and supports the role of HSS. The gentleman's time's expired. Continue the gentleman from California reserve. is recognized. The gentleman reserves. reserves. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield one minute uh, to the gentlelady from Maine, Ms. Pingree. The gentlelady from Maine is recognized for one minute. I thank the ranking member for yielding his time, Mr. Speaker. The amendment I am sponsoring today sends a loud and clear message to the Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs. It sends a message that we recognize that the problem of sexual assault in the military is real and significant. It sends a message that the VA should live up to their promise and remove the barriers to benefits for victims. But most importantly, it sends a message to the survivors. The men and women I have met with who volunteered to serve were dedicating their lives to a military career when they suddenly found out their world was crashing in on them when they became victims of sexual assault. It sends a message to them that we hear them, we recognize the pain and the injustice they have suffered, and we will not stand for it. I met with Secretary Panetta recently, and I know he understands this problem and is committed to changing the culture, but we cannot call that good enough. We need to say in no uncertain terms that we will not allow the men and women who wear the uniform to become victims of sexual assault and that we will not forget those who waited too long for the benefits they deserve. I yield back. General Eddie yields back. Gentleman from California Reserves. Can I ask how much time we have? The gentleman from uh, Washington has five minutes remaining. The gentleman from California has six and a quarter minutes remaining. Reserve. Gentleman from California Reserves. Gentleman from Washington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield one minute to the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Murphy. The gentleman from Connecticut is recognized for one minute. I thank the ranking member. I rise today to support my amendment number 97, originally introduced as the American Jobs Matter Act that's included in this uh, unblock package. This amendment will finally allow American manufacturers to compete fairly for Department of Defense contracts. Uh, my state, which has built submarines for the Navy and supplied our armed forces for generations, has lost about 130,000 manufacturing jobs in the last 20 years, and this country has lost about 6 million. And at the same time, the Department of Defense, the largest purchaser of goods in the world, has been aggressively outsourcing work to foreign firms. Instead of finding ways to get around the Buy America law, DOD should be doing more to help protect manufacturing jobs here at home. When we lose the capacity to produce an item that our military needs, we put ourselves at risk and we also lose jobs. Now, this amendment simply allows for the federal government to consider the amount of jobs being created here in the United States as a part of a bid for U.S. defense work. And frankly, most of my constituents and our constituents probably think this already happens. But this is an important amendment for job creation, but also for U.S. national security. 
I'd like to thank Chairman McKeon and Ranking Member Smith for their willingness to work together on this issue. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from California is recognized. Reserve. The gentleman from California reserves. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield one minute to the gentlelady from California, Ms. Chu. The gentlelady from California is recognized for one minute. I have a personal reason for offering this amendment. My nephew was a victim of military hazing, and it killed him. Harry Liu was serving in the Marines in Afghanistan when his peers ordered him to dig a foxhole, do push-ups, crunches, and planks with his heavy full-body armor and a 25-pound sandbag. They stomped, kicked, and punched him and poured the entire contents of a sandbag onto his face and in his mouth. It lasted a full three hours and 20 minutes. Twenty minutes later, he committed suicide. I thank Chairman McKeon and Wilson and Ranking Member Smith because this bill takes the most significant steps to protect service members from hazing ever. My amendment adds a GAO report so we can have an objective analysis of the DOD's anti-hazing policies. It also adds an annual report to Congress on what the DOD is doing to prevent hazing so that we can ensure there is real accountability. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from California is recognized. Reserve. The gentleman from California reserves. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. I reserve as well. We have one more speaker. I don't believe um, he's present, and I reserve. The gentleman from Washington reserves. <laughs> we don't have any more speakers. So. Okay. Uh, from California Reserves, gentleman from Washington is recognized. Uh, we yield back the balance of our time. We can move on. Gentleman from California. I encourage all members to support the M Block Amendment and yield back the balance of our time. The questions on the amendments in Block offered by the gentleman from California. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the unblock amendments are agreed to. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 3, printed in House Report 112-485. For what purpose does a gentleman from Ohio seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment Number 3, printed in House Report Number 112-485, offered by Mr. Kucinich of Ohio. Pursuant to House Resolution 661, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, and a member opposed each will control five minutes. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio. I yield myself one minute. The gentleman's recognized for one minute. The administration's use of signature strikes raises the risk of death to innocent civilians or individuals who have had no relationship to attacks on the United States. We know that the U.S. has made mistakes and who's been at the receiving end of its drone uh, strike program and this was when we knew the identity of the person being targeted. A recent report by the Bureau of Investigative Journalism estimates that at least 2,292 people have been killed by U.S. drone strikes in Pakistan since 2004. The Bureau estimates that of that number, over 350 are civilians. A July 2009 Brookings Institution report stated 10 civilians die for every one suspected militant from U.S. drone strikes. Yet another study by the New American Foundation concluded that out of the 114 drone attacks in Pakistan, at least 32 percent of those killed by the strikes were civilians. Again, that was before we allowed drone strikes based only on signature behaviors. We cannot deny that our drone strikes have resulted in the death of innocent people. Reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Mr. What purpose the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I rise to claim the time in opposition to the gentleman amendment. Gentleman from Texas is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. At this time, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would yield uh, a minute and a half to the distinguished ranking member, and I'm glad to do sure. so on, a, on an Ironically, issue where we yes. agree. Thank you. Washington. I rise in opposition to the amendment. I think the gentleman raises a very legitimate point. Uh, the exercise of strikes against terrorist targets does need proper oversight. Uh, and there are a number of ways in which I think we can have greater transparency in those decisions, frankly, whether they're sig signature strikes or against individuals. But the bottom line is Al Qaeda declared war against us in 1996. Uh, they are actively prosecuting that war against us from a number of different locations, uh, many of which we don't have as much information as we would like, but clearly in the northwest section of, pa or, sorry, in the federally administered tribal areas of Pakistan, in Yemen and Somalia. They are organizing training camps and they are actively pursuing us. Our Joint Special Operations campaign, Camp Command is trying to keep track of those networks and keep them from attacking us. The ability to hit 
those training camps is an important part of protecting us from terrorist attacks. As General McChrystal said, it takes a network to beat a network. We need our network to have the ability to stop al-Qaeda's network. They declared war against us. They haven't changed their mind. It is still something that we need to be able to adequately protect this country against. This amendment unduly restricts our military's ability to protect this country. And with that, I, I yield back to the uh, gentleman. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, is recognized. Uh, I yield myself one half minute. The gentleman's recognized for one half minute. But we're talking about the deaths of innocent people here. A recent article published in the Washington Post revealed that the Central Intelligence Agency and the Joint Special Operations Command have been given new authority that allows them to fire upon targets based solely on their so-called intelligence signatures, patterns of behavior that are detected through signal intercepts, human sources, aerial surveillance, and that indicated a presence of an important operative or plot against U.S. interests. But allowing a CIA and JSOC to conduct drone strikes without having to know the identity of the person they're targeting is in stark contrast to targeted strikes against suspected terrorists on lists maintained by the CIA, on lists maintained by the CIA and JSOC. The gentleman's time's expired. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I would yield a minute and a half to the distinguished gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Andrews. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for a minute and a half. I my friend, I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. I rise to, to respectfully disagree with the amendment from, uh, offered by a person for whom I have great respect. And I, I know that he offers this amendment because he certainly wants to uh, avoid a situation where our country uh, arbitrarily takes innocent human life. I think he's right to, sh to have that concern, and I think it's one that's widely held. I think that the issue raised by this amendment, though, is whether others can be entrusted with striking that same balance or whether the Congress should enact a unilateral prohibition against certain kinds of activities. When um, the decision makers who operate these drone strikes make a decision, they have to strike this balance between our moral obligation to avoid arbitrary attacks on innocent people and our moral obligation to defend our country. And I think that they are capable of striking that balance, and I frankly think that a blanket prohibition against the use of these strikes, except in circumstances where we know the identity of the target, unduly restricts them in making that judgment. I, I, I certainly understand and sympathize with the goal of this amendment, but because I think it unduly restricts our options, I would urge its defeat and yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized. I uh, yield two minutes to the co-sponsor of the amendment, uh, the uh, ranking Democrat on judiciary, Mr. Conyers of Michigan. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for two minutes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I, I thank the author of the amendment, and I join with him in it because, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the administration policy up till now has been quite clear. Drones pursue specific individuals who appear on a target list maintained by the CIA and initiate attacks only when drone operators are confident that the individual being targeted is a terrorist on that list. Now, what uh, this amendment attempts to ensure is that the missile strikes being used uh, by the CIA or the Joint Special Operations Command are targeting actual terrorists and that pose a threat to our national security and not against civilians who may look suspicious to a drone operator operating uh, thousands of miles away. And so what I am saying is merely that a new expanded drone policy that allows for indiscriminate missile strikes against supposedly suspicious individuals obviously increases the risk of civilian deaths and risk inflaming an already powerful anti-American sentiment abroad. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this policy uh, will not make us any safer. It will do just the opposite. And so I encourage my colleagues to support our amendment so that the Congress assures 
that accountability and a measure of precision and due process are retained as critical components of our country's drone policy. And I reserve the balance of our time. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I reserve the balance of the time. The gentleman from Texas reserves. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized. I'm prepared to close. The gentleman from, gentleman from Texas. I reserve. I'm prepared to close. I have the right to close. Uh, yeah, yeah. Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chair Mr. Chairman, who has the right to close on this amendment? The gentleman from Texas has the right to close. The what? Um, uh, uh, further parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman, how much time remains Mr. on our uh, side? Pardon? Clear. The gentleman uh, from Texas has two and a half minutes remaining. The gentleman from Ohio has one and a half minutes remaining. Mr. Chairman, I, I would yield uh, uh, one minute to the distinguished gentleman from Rhode Island, the ranking member of the Emerging Threats and Capabilities Subcommittee. The gentleman from Rhode Island is recognized for one minute. Asking the consent to revise and extend. Without objection. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, and I appreciate the, the gentleman from Ohio and the gentleman from Michigan for offering this amendment. But unfortunately, uh, I must rise in, in opposition. I, I certainly share their concerns, and I know of their good intentions. And I certainly uh, share the author's concerns over civilian casualties. And, and certainly, even one civilian death is too many. But, Mr. Speaker, we should not jeopardize our men and women uh, in uniform by hamstringing their ability to engage when threatened or return fire. Certainly the uh, predators are incredibly powerful tools and they need to be used judiciously and appropriately and I believe that they are only when necessary. The language here as it uh, is written would threaten many uh, of the most uh, urgent uses of remotely piloted aircraft. For example, if our troops are under fire from an unknown assailant or uh, if an insurgent is placing a bomb, this language uh, as I read it would prohibit targeting that individual. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, patterns of behavior are certainly appropriate uh, indicators and are vetted strenuously. Uh, John Brennan, uh, uh, the White House has indicated and stated publicly that uh, the drone strike policy was rooted in adherence to law and indeed the authorization for use of military force provides the President with the authority, I quote, to use all necessary and appropriate force. So uh, I appreciate the gentleman for offering, would the gentleman yield another 30 seconds? Yield the gentleman another 15 seconds. The gentleman's recognized for 15 seconds. I appreciate the gentleman for yielding. Uh, there are strict policies about how these tools can be used. There has to be a significant threat to, US, to, to the United States. Uh, action uh, could mitigate or prevent an actual threat from materializing. Capture or uh, it capture is not feasible or could put U.S. service men and women in, uh, in undue harm. And collateral damage and harm to civilians is, is minimal. There's strict criteria before they can be used, and uh, I think there are tools that, that that's a tool that we need to preserve. Thank you, and I yield back to the time. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized. Parliamentary inquiry. General, state your inquiry. Uh, as a matter of uh, procedure, who has the right to close? Uh, the sponsor of an amendment or the opponent of an amendment? The opponent representing the p position of the committee has a right to close. Okay. Thank you very the much. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized. And I'm, I'm prepared to close. And how much time do I have remaining, please? The gentleman has one and a half minutes remaining. One and a half minutes. One and a half minutes. The gentleman's okay. correct. In the absence of transparency and accountability for the drones program abroad, overreach is unchecked. The administration refuses to release the legal justification for permitting so-called signature drone strikes. The administration refuses to disclose whether and how there's any follow-up with the families of innocent civilians who die from a drone strike. The administration refuses to disclose whether civilian casualties are collected, tracked, and analyzed. Our amendment, the Conyers uh, Kucinich Amendment, recognizes that innocent civilians should not be collateral damage. It recognizes that sending an unmanned plane to drop bombs without knowing the identity of a target does not reflect American values. It recognizes that drones bombing people of unknown identity will generate powerful and enduring anti-American sentiment that prolongs and expands wars. It recognizes that Congress did not give the executive, uh, uh, the, the president, unlimited and unchecked power to expand our wars abroad especially when it does not even bother to give Congress 
the legal justification to do so. Now, you know, it became clear that the authorization for the use of military force uh, is being interpreted, given carte blanche to circumvent Congress, and we ought to put an end to it right now. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment raises a number of concerns. It is a very strange thing, for example, to say in a war, you have to know the name, rank, and serial number of the person that you're about to shoot before you can even shoot them. And, and to put it a little more in, in this context, this amendment, the gentleman from Ohio's amendment would say that if we see people making bombs down there that are going to be used against our service people, that we can't do anything about it, we've just got to watch them, uh, and, and then even after the bomb explodes, unless we know the identity, which is the language in the amendment, unless we know the name of the person down there, we can't do anything about it with all of the technology that's available to the United States. And actually, it gets even worse. If we see al-Qaeda members shooting at our troops down there, if we don't know the identity or the name of the people doing the shooting, then we can't do anything about it. Surely that carries things far too far. We can't debate in the, in the open house uh, all of the allegations that are made in newspaper articles. What we can do is, uh, is say what the National Security Advisor of the President has said, that uh, these sorts of capabilities are only used pursuant to law, and they are only used where there's a significant threat to the U.S., where action could mitigate or prevent the threat, and that collateral damage or harm to civilians is absolutely minimal. That, that helps protect our soldiers and our country. The gentleman's time's expired. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Ohio. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. Aye. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it and the amendment is not agreed to. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized. It is now in order to consider amendment number four, printed in House Report 112-485. For purposes of the gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher, seek recognition. Yes, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number four, printed in House Report number 112-485, offered by Mr. Rohrbacher of California. Pursuant to House Resolution 661, the gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Since 9-11, the United States has given Pakistan about $22 billion. That money has served only to embolden Pakistan's government to maintain the brutal repression over its own people and to continue its blatant support for terrorist attacks on neighboring countries as well as attacks on American troops in nearby Afghanistan. My amendment would cut off all aid in this bill designated for Pakistan. It would end the charade that we are buying cooperation in the ongoing struggle against terrorist forces in South Asia. Pakistan isn't with us in a war against terrorism. They are at war with us. Pakistan, at best, is a war profiteer collecting a ransom from taxing our military supplies that pass through their country, which for the past six months, by the way, they have closed to resupplying our forces in Afghanistan. They are laughing all the way to the bank. Of course, the Pakistani people will never see any of that money. The corruption in Pakistan itself is reason not to give aid to them, which they will then pilfer. Furthermore, they use their military power to butcher uh, the Baluchis and others who don't want to be under their corrupt thumb. How can we forget this same Pakistani government gave safe haven to Osama bin Laden after he led the conspiracy that slaughtered 3,000 Americans on 9-11? After our SEALs went in to get him, the Pakistani government took the wreckage of a downed stealth helicopter of ours and gave it for study to communist China, whom they refer to as our, uh, what was it now, our all-weather friend. The Pakistani government 
has gone so far as to arrest and imprison without trial Dr. Afridi, the doctor who helped us gather the intelligence that located Osama bin Laden in the nest that this Pakistani government had provided him right there in Pakistan. The Pakistani government threw him in jail and are talking about trying him for treason for the good deed that he helped us in bringing to justice the man who slaughtered 3,000 of our citizens. And we can continue to give money to these people even as we ignore the suffering of Dr. Afridi, who is in prison now, languishing in prison, and all of us are forgetting this hero? We have lost almost 2,000 American, Americans who defend our country as part of Operation Enduring Freedom. Most of those deaths were due to Pakistani-inspired and supported insurgents. How much more does the Pakistan government have to do before we quit giving them our money? They are playing us like fools while murdering our soldiers, and yes, we are acting like fools for giving them this money despite that. We should have quit bankrolling this rotten regime a long time ago. My amendment would do just that. The Pakistan, uh, the Pakistan government is a terrorist government that murders and even attacks its own people like they are in Balochistan. They are a pro-terrorist, radical Islamic clique that rules Pakistan. They don't deserve one penny from us to help them in their dirty deeds, and I would ask support from my colleagues, and let's finally stand up. If we, need a, if we need an ally in that area, let's go to some people in that area that want to be our friends, perhaps the Indians. I uh, uh, reserve the balance of my the time. The gentleman reserves. What purpose does the gentleman from Washington seek recognition? To claim the time in opposition. The gentleman from Washington is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Conaway. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for two minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the, uh, the gentleman yielding me two minutes. And I uh, strongly urge uh, opposition to this amendment uh, with some heavy heart because uh, some of the things that my good colleague have said are maybe accurate. Much of it is inflammatory and not accurate. But nevertheless, I don't want to be seen as an apologist for uh, Pakistan. But by the same token, we have trimmed the amount of money on subject to this authorization and to this amendment uh, by half. We have strengthened the, uh, the uh, controls around that money to require Pakistan to certify to us, to, to uh, Secretary Panetta, that uh, in fact this uh, money is being spent in the fight against counterterrorism. Uh, we will have additional amendments on the floor this afternoon that don't have any opposition, which will further strengthen that certification process. Uh, and by restricting all funds under the DOD position, uh, simply does, plays into the bad guys' hands in Pakistan. It will give them no incentives in which to work with us, and it will further their strength of resolve to close the, the uh, cross-border, uh, overland uh, passage of uh, U.S. military goods to, uh, to assist us with uh, the fight in Afghanistan. And while my good colleague has uh, uh, much uh, greater experience with uh, some of those folks in that part of the world than I do. Nevertheless, I uh, stand in opposition to his amendment. It's uh, a meat cleaver when we ought to be uh, going at it the way we've done it, by trimming the money back, putting restrictions on that money that will force the Pakistanis in order to get it. And by the way, they've not gotten money from DOD since uh, June of 2010. So uh, while the pirate uh, uh, comments that he's made might apply to all funding for the State Department and everything else, it only applies to the Department of Defense money. We've not given them money since June of 2010. We have adequate protections in the bill this time, and we'll strengthen those protections later on in the, uh, of the debate and the uh, votes this afternoon. And uh, I stand in opposition to the, uh, uh, to the deal. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The I have reserved the balance of my time. The gentleman from California reserves. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Yeah, I yield uh, one minute to the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. The gentlelady from Texas is recognized for one minute. I thank the gentleman, and certainly I've worked with the gentleman from California on a number of issues, and I rise in vigorous opposition as the co-chair and one of the founders of the Pakistan Caucus uh, to this amendment. Uh, and let me um, frame uh, the reason. First of all, uh, we have a very responsible and sizable Pakistani-American community that champions the idea of a democratic and economically stable Pakistan. It was only a few years ago that Benazir Bhutto was assassinated. However, the government that has carried on, although living in a difficult neighborhood and having difficult challenges, is a result of her efforts uh, to try to bring democracy to Pakistan. The people of Pakistan live in a very difficult neighborhood, and if we abandon this assistance, uh, obviously uh, defense assistance, 
We abandoned the people of Pakistan. We abandoned those who wanted education, economic stability. We abandoned those soldiers in the Pakistani military who have fallen in battle, fighting against terrorists. We will abandon those who have been in the Swat Valley. We will abandon those who have been in the mountains of Pakistan. We will abandon those who want democracy. And we will abandon Pakistan. Can I get additional uh, 50, 50, 25 seconds? I yield the uh, gentlelady an additional 20 seconds. Okay, we'll abandon those seconds. who are fighting for democracy. Uh, with the Pakistani president uh, heading to participate in NATO, with Ambassador Sherry Raymond here, who interacts with members of Congress, let me tell the American people, Pakistan is an effective ally with challenges. And we should not deny them the opportunity to correct and turn the corner. I ask my colleagues to recognize the value of Pakistan's alliance. It is better to be engaged than to not be engaged. Let us oppose uh, this amendment. It is the wrong direction to go. General I yield Lays, back. General Lays, time's expired. The gentleman from California is recognized. Uh, yes, I would reserve the balance of my time until we're just about ready to close. And then the gentleman reserves. Make our closing arguments. We have two more speakers, so I will uh, yield uh, at this point uh, one minute to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Thornberry. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think all of us share many of the frustrations voiced by the gentleman from California, but his amendment goes too far. I agree we should look for additional allies in the region. The problem is there's not another ally in the region through which our military can be supplied. So for the sake of our troops in Afghanistan, as well as a lot of the broader interests in the region, it is important for us to try to improve our relationship with Pakistan. And as my colleague from Texas says, in the bill now, we cut the funds from DOD in half, and we require a certification that Pakistan is supporting our counterterrorism efforts, that they are supporting efforts to dismantle the IED networks, that they are preventing the proliferation of nuclear-related material. They are issuing uh, visas in a timely manner for U.S. government personnel involved in counterterrorism efforts. We put severe restrictions on any assistance that they get. But that's a carrot to encourage them to work with us rather than saying, no, you get nothing. Time's expired. Gentleman from California. How, many, uh, I, how much time do I gentleman have? Gentleman from here? California has one, one minute remaining. The gentleman from uh, Washington has 45 seconds remaining. All right. And is it, uh, then I would uh, proceed and... Uh, uh, just my understanding that the other side closes in this? From Washington has the right to close. Okay, thank you very much. Then I will proceed. Uh, well, I have here uh, 19 pages, I believe, or is it uh, 13 pages of restrictions that we have had on Pakistan aid over the last few years. 13 pages of restrictions that have meant nothing. During the time that we have been giving them billions of dollars, with all of these restrictions, they have been giving safe haven to Osama bin Laden, who massacred and slaughtered 3,000 Americans. How can we forget about that? How can we just go on and give these people money? Yeah, Pakistan is our friend. No, Pakistan, the people of Pakistan can be our friend. They are our friend. But we have to recognize that their government has, has, is a terrorist-supporting government and a radical Islamic supporting government. And we continue to give them money as they support insurgents that kill our people overseas. Is there any doubt about that? Admiral Mullen confirmed it for us. Why are we ignoring that? We're acting like fools and we're acting like cowards. It's time for us to stand up for the American defenders who are over there putting their lives on the line and say no. If we can't give, if we're, if we're going to give money to the people killing you, we're not going to do that, period. That's going over the line. I would suggest to my gentleman colleagues to join me in defunding the enemy of the United States. The gentleman's time's expired. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield myself the balance of our time. The gentleman's recognized for 45 seconds. We are not ignoring any of that. All of those issues are things we discuss in the Armed Services Committee, are very much aware of, very concerned about. But the bottom line is, as my colleagues have pointed out, Regrettably, Pakistan is in a part of the world where we have national security interests. Pakistan has at various times provided critical support to allow us to get the supplies we need to our troops in Afghanistan. They have also assisted us in going after various terrorist groups inside of Pakistan. That help has been maybe 2% of what we would like it to be, but that 2%, regrettably, is help we cannot turn away. 
It is a very problematic relationship. I think the gentleman who offered this amendment described that quite well, but we cannot afford to simply cut it off because of how important that region is to our national security interests. His amendment would do that, and it's bad policy for this country, bad policy for our troops, and bad policy for our national security interests. Therefore, I would urge us to oppose it. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed will say no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. And I ask for a recorded vote. The gentleman from California seeks recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California will be postponed. In order to consider amendment number 5, printed in House Report 112-485, for purposes of General Lady from California, seek recognition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The Lee clerk amendment. will designate the amendment. Amendment number five, printed in House Report number 112-485, offered by Ms. Lee of California. Pursuant to House Resolution 661, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lee, and a member opposed each will control 10 minutes. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from California. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. First, let me just say this. It is just downright outrageous that the McGovern-Jones amendment was ruled out of order by the Rules Committee. Denied